Alrighty, as uh, people are trickling in, I'll just kind of do our little introduction, but um, welcome everyone. Uh, if you wanted to introduce yourselves uh, in the chat box, please do. Uh, my name is Kendall and I'm the Education and Events Coordinator with the Downey Lakes Land Trust. We're a nonprofit based out of Grand Lake Stream, Maine. And we're devoted to the long term economic and environmental well being of the Down East Lakes region through exemplary management of our forests and waters. Um, we have about 56,000 acres um, up here in Grand Lake Stream, and we're partnering with uh, the Down East Coastal Conservancy to present to you this webinar series. So, Kathy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Kendall. So I'm Kathy. If anyone doesn't know me, I am uh, Danny's Coastal Conservancy's membership and outreach director, and DCC is also a Washington County Land Trust. We have mostly coastal properties from Steuben up to Lubeck, and our office is right in Machias. So I'll turn it back over to you, Kendall. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so we'll do a uh, question and answer session sort of towards the end of our presentation here. Um, so you can put your questions into the chat box um, or save them until the end. Um, but today we're here with Morgan Engels, who is a wildlife biologist with Acadia National Park. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Morgan. And um, I will turn it over to you. All right, um, well, I'm gonna try and share my screen and we'll hope this all works. Oh. Maybe. Yes, we could see you. And yeah, it worked. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, so I'm going <laughs> to talk a little bit about bats today and bats in um, Down East Maine. And um, oh, before I jump in too far, I always like to give photo credits. So uh, all of the all the photos in this are either taken by me or other park staff. Um, and if they aren't, then they are credited somewhere. Uh, so this one actually is, uh, this is a drawing that my partner does. All right, so. This is me. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm a, a biotech at Acadia National Park and I run the bat program there. And um, yeah, I, I've been doing a lot of bat work sort of around the Northeast for the past, uh, I don't know, 10-ish years. And really been at Acadia more solidly since, I don't know, 2017. And yeah, I like that. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit just about bats in general. I don't know what people know about bats, but uh, I like to just talk about them a little bit and like dispel some myths maybe. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what bat species we have in Maine and some techniques that we use to study bats. And then a little bit about what bat research is currently happening, um, which will be mostly Acadia focused because that's where I work. But I'll try to add in a couple of things that the rest of the state's up to. Okay, so first, this is a bat, and these are the parts of the bat. Um, so one thing that I think is really cool about bats is that where their thumb is is not where you necessarily would think their thumb is. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see the little thumb is labeled there. And so if you think about where your thumb is, then if you think about your fingers all really elongated and with a um, like a a skin between them, that's that's what bats are using to fly. That's how they've evolved to fly is with these really long fingers. So, oh, the other thing that's important to point out here are the really big ears because it's very important for um, echolocation. And oh, I guess I should just mention for anybody who doesn't know, that bats are mammals just like humans. So um, they give birth to live young and they lactate. Oh, and they're covered in, covered in some fuzzy fur. Okay, so a little bit about bat reproduction, and I never really know where to jump into this cycle because it's a cycle, but um, 
I guess I'll start with with baby bats. Um, baby bats are called pups, and they're born uh, around the end of July. Whoa, sorry, the end of June. And it takes them about um, a month to learn to fly. And so during that time, they're hanging out with their mom and um, maybe in a maternity colony with a bunch of other um, adult females and a bunch of other pups. And so after about a month, they can fly on their own. And then when you move into the fall, we move into the fall swarm season. And during fall swarm is when um, bats are meeting. They get together in these big swarms and, um, and that's when they mate. But they do this tricky thing because the next, the next part of the year is hibernation. And during hibernation, they want to conserve all of their energy. So it doesn't really make sense for female bats to go into hibernation and be pregnant like all at the same time. And so they do a tricky thing where they store their sperm. So males and females both go into hibernation during the winter. And then in the spring, when females come out of hibernation, then the egg implants and they um, actually like become pregnant. And then they give birth to their, their pups in June. And most of our species here in Maine um, and in the Northeast in general um, only have one pup a year. There are a couple species that might have twins, but pretty much just one pup. So they're not like, uh, not like, um, I don't know, mice where they can have just tons and tons of um, young all at once in a bunch every year. People always think, oh, they're small, like they must have a whole, a whole bunch of young every year, but nope, just, just one. Oh, and um, I really love these little illustrations um, and they come from the Save Lucy campaign. And so I like to credit the Save Lucy campaign whenever I use them. Um, so go, go check them out. They do great bat conservation work. Okay, so I talked a little bit about reproduction and like the a year in the life of a bat. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about like a day in the life of a bat. So bats are obviously um, on sort of the opposite schedule from us, or at least from some of us. Uh, so they uh, they wake up in the evening and you know, move around a little bit. Uh, and then they might go and get something to drink and then they start looking for a meal. So they spend most of the night foraging, um, but they might take, take a break during the evening. Sometimes during the night, they might take a break and go to a night roost, um, especially if the weather is bad, they'll, they'll go hang out somewhere, um, somewhere protected for a while. Uh, or if, um, if you have a, a female that has a pup, she might be going back and forth um, from her roost where the pup is to go out and forage and come back and check on the pup. Um, but then in the, in the morning, they will go find a day roost and then they're gonna hang out there for the day. And the day roosts are somewhere protected where um, uh, they're not gonna worry about predators coming and eating them and they can just be quiet. And so uh, this little bat in this picture um, is a northern long-eared bat that um, we had a radio transmitter on, which I'll, I'll talk about later, but we were able to, to find its day roost just hanging out in this little, little granite pocket, um, Acadia. Okay, so I mentioned the ears and how Ears are important because bats um, use echolocation. And so one, one myth is that bats are blind and bats are not blind. <laughs> they actually can see like pretty well, um, but they use echolocation to hunt for their prey at night. And so the way that echolocation works is bats send out this high frequency sound pulse of noise and then they're they're listening for with their big ears, they're listening for it to come back to them. And the way that it sounds when it comes back 
can give them kind of a, a picture of what's out there. And so uh, you might have a bat that's a beetle specialist. And so it sends out this pulse of noise and it's listening for that echo to come back that, that sounds like what they know a shape, the, the shape of a beetle would sound like. And that's how they, they hunt for their prey. Um, anytime I talk about bats, I have to talk about uh, white nose syndrome, which is the really sad part of being a bat biologist. Um, white nose syndrome is a fungal infection uh, caused by Pseudogymnorascus destructans um, that was first identified in the Albany area of New York in um, 2006, and it has spread since then, as you can see on the map there. Um, it, let's see, hit Maine in 2010, and it really hit Acadia in like the winter of 2011, 2012. And what happens is it, uh, it infects um, any exposed tissue on the bat when the bat's hibernating. And because bats are trying to conserve energy when they're hibernating, they have slowed their immune systems down. And so they can't fight off this infection, this fungal infection. And so um, the spores will build up um, on the parts of the bat that, that don't have fur, including the face. And so it looks like they have this white nose, which is where the name comes from. Um, and different species are more susceptible to white nose syndrome than others, but there have been major declines in some species, species um, up to 97% in some. And so it's the, it's the really sad uh, story about bats. And you can see in this, in this photo here, this is what can happen to the wings um, after they've been, uh, after the, the fungus has really gotten in there and eaten away the tissue. Um, but if the bat can make it through the winter and the wings aren't too damaged and it can fly and uh, get something to eat when it comes out of hibernation in the spring, then these tears, they will heal. Um, that membrane, that wing membrane is actually, um, it, it heals, heals up pretty fast. So there is, there is some hope for bats that at least can make it through the winter. Okay, so what, what species of bats do we have? Um, we, we have eight species of bats here in Maine, and um, they all look a little different. Um, let's see, well, oh, I should mention that all of these pictures were taken in Maine, except for that silver-haired bat down in the corner. Um, I took that in New York State, but our bats really fall into two groups. Um, so the, there's the, the subset that, that migrate, you know, like birds, they're gonna head south for the, for the winter and go somewhere a little bit warmer to, to spend their winter. And then there are the bats that hibernate. And uh, a lot of the bats that hibernate are the ones that are more susceptible to white nose syndrome and uh, they're the species that we're sort of particularly worried about. Although the, those migratory bats um, are the ones that are more susceptible to mortality from wind turbines. So it's, it's just hard to be a bat these days. Um, anyway, we're, we're particularly interested in our myota species just because they have been the hardest hit by white nose syndrome. And so those are the the eastern small-footed bat, um, on the top in the middle, the little brown bat, um, over here on the right-hand side, and the northern long-eared bat. Um, and the northern long-eared bat actually uh, was listed as threatened um, under the Endangered Species Act uh, in 2014. So that's one that the, the federal government is particularly interested in. And that's just because their numbers are, are so low after, after white nose syndrome. 
or due to white nose syndrome. It's not like it's stopped happening. Okay, so how do we study bats? This is, <laughs> this is my friend Molly pondering that question. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple of techniques that we use. Um, and these, this is not extensive. There are many other techniques that people use to study bats, but these are just some of the ones that uh, we use at Acadia and that we're sort of more, most familiar with. And I would say that really it's these first two and then everything else comes from those. So through acoustic detection. So bats use echolocation to uh, hunt for their prey. And because our bats eat different things, they echolocate uh, at different frequencies. And so um, we can use these different frequencies uh, to sort of, well, we can listen in on those frequencies and um, use, use the different frequencies to determine what kind of bats, what species of bats um, are, are using the area where our, our microphone is set up. So um, there are some sort of pros and cons to acoustic detection. Um, but it's great because it doesn't stress out the animal because you don't have to touch the animal. Um, and you can collect a lot of data fairly easily. And it's good for collecting temporal data. So if you want to know what's happening, um, like how much bat activity is happening in an area over a long period of time, um, then acoustic detection is a, is a great way to go. Um, but you can't collect data on specific animals because all bats of one species are going to echolocate more or less the same way. And so you can't pick out individual animals. And in fact, some of our species um, have echolocation calls that are so similar to one another that it's hard to determine which species you're actually um, looking at when you're looking at the, the sonogram. The, that's that, that call sequence down at the bottom, the, sort of a visual representation of the sound. Um, and so it's not, you can't always say like, oh, this, this species of bat was here. You might have to just say, well, <laughs> this could be any of these three species. Um, but it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great tool and it's good to have a lot of different tools. So our other, our other big tool is um, misnetting. And so with misnetting, you're actually capturing live bats and then you have a, a bat in your hand that you can do things with. Um, and the major disadvantage to this is obviously that it stresses out the bat to some extent. Um, you know, we, we try and do everything we can so that to, to reduce that stress, we try not to handle them very long and um, we try and handle them carefully and uh, everybody's trained and things like that. But just there's going to be stress when you're, when you're handling an animal. It's also um, pretty expensive and it takes a lot of time because you have to have a lot of people and um, you have to set up these misnets and there are these, so you can see sort of from this picture that uh, there are these, these um, big rectangular nets and uh, we put them across travel corridors and bats actually use sort of in some ways similar travel corridors to the ones that we use. Um, they might use trails or roads or streams or rivers. Um, and so we try and put them somewhere where there's a, a little bit of a funnel. So maybe there's some, some trees on the side and like a branch over the top. And so uh, they have to go through this little space. Well, not too little, but smaller space. And so if you can cover that space with a net, then they 
might not see it uh, and they might smack into it and get get caught and that's then we go and we untangle them um oh let's see where was i uh so one of the advantages to misnoting is that you can get information about individual bats um you can look at how old they are and you can look at their reproductive status and you can see if they're male or female and then you can um collect samples that might be able to tell you something about the health of the bat. Um, and once you have a bat in hand, then there's a couple of other techniques that you can use um, to get more information. And so one of those techniques is banding. And for anybody who knows about bird banding, this is very similar. Um, we use these little metal bands but instead of putting them on the on the leg like you would with a bird, um, they actually go on the the forearm, and they're they're split metal. So you put them on and you pinch them on, um, and they uh, they should be there for the life of the animal. Excuse me. Um, and so by by banding animals, you can tell individuals apart if you recapture them, and uh, if you recapture them over time, then you get a sense of how long they live. And so we know that so bats are, are really long, really long lived animals, which is which is interesting because they're very small. Um, but if they live up, I think there's some little brown bats that have been maybe the oldest one is 26 or something. I'm not sure in the in the 20s. So they they have a very long lifespan. And um, at Acadia, we've been banding for a long time and we have recaptured bats that are, uh, I think up to nine years old, which is pretty exciting. You know, you have a bat that's lived that long. And even if you only recapture a bat that you banded the year before, you at least know that it made it through the winter. And you might be able to say, you know, if it's a female and it's pregnant, then you can say like, Oh, great, it made it through the winter and it's reproducing. So there might be more bats soon. And um, so that's really that's really good information um, for us as scientists, because then we can start to have a better idea of how this population is going to do going forward. So that's some advantages of, of banding. Um, <laughs> you can use light tags. I admit that I included this slide because this picture is cool. Um, we don't actually use light tags very often, um, but you can take their, their basically um, teeny tiny glow sticks and you use just like a tiny, tiny bit of glue and you glue the glow stick to the, to the tummy of the bat and it, it only stays on for uh, not very long. The bat can get to its stomach just fine. So it's going to pull it off probably within the night. Um, but uh, having a bat with a light tag means that you could do something like um, you could take some recordings uh, that then you could put together to form um, a, a library um, that you could you could use for your acoustics. So if you have a bunch of a bunch of acoustic calls from bats that you've had in your hand and so you've identified them, um, then you can feed that information into uh, like a, a computer program that can give you a better sense of what species you're looking at. So if you wanna take some, some bat calls then, and be really sure that the bat you're recording is the bat that you uh, had in your hand and you know the species of, you might use a light tag. Um, but like I said, it's just a full picture. <laughs> um, the technique that I think gives us the most information in some ways um, is radio telemetry. And so this is this little tiny radio transmitter that we glue onto the back of a bat. Um, and you can see the size, uh, 
it's on the bat in this picture. And then that long metal part that comes out the end is an antenna and it's uh, flexible. And um, this radio transmitter is going to stay on this bat. Well, we hope we get a week out of it. Um, they, they don't like them and they'll, they'll chew them off pretty fast. Um, but we use a, like a surgical glue and um, we hope to get about a week of data. And the battery in the transmitter doesn't last very long anyway. It'll probably only last for, I don't know, 14 to 21 days. So we sort of get what we can out of it while it's on there. But the way that the transmitter works is it's, it's sort of just like, um, like an actual radio. So it sends off a little signal and then we have a receiver and we know what frequency the radio transmitter is sending out a signal at. And so you dial that in just like you would dial in a frequency on your radio, you dial it in on our receiver, and then we just listen for the signal from the radio transmitter. Um, the unfortunate thing is that because these are very small, because the bats themselves are very small, so you can't put anything big on there, um, the signal is not very strong. And so you have to be fairly close um, to, the, to the transmitter for the receiver to pick it up, um, which gets even trickier when there's mountains and uh, coastal Maine has a lot of mountains. <laughs> So um, it can be a challenge, but um, we do get a lot of really good information um, out of these, these radio transmitters when we, when we put them on bats. And so this is my friend Lara with, um, so the that receiver that I talked about is that, that brown box she has here. And then she's holding this directional antenna. So we probably were driving around the area and we heard the signal from the bat and now we're um, hiking up the side of a mountain trying to figure out where exactly that bat is. Because um, there's a lot of information uh, that we can gain from finding their, those, those day roosts. Oh, this, I'm going faster than I thought. I hope um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what research is currently happening in Maine. Um, and like I said, I don't, I'm, it's going to be heavily focused on Acadia because that's where I work, but I know that the state is up to a couple different bat projects, so I can talk about them a little bit. So one of the projects that they're working on is looking for alternative hibernaculus. So during the winter, bats are hibernating. And for the most part, um, they're hibernating in caves and mines. Um, but if you know anything about the geology of Maine, then you know that we don't have a lot of um, soluble rock that, that forms nice caves. And so there aren't that many known bat hibernacula in the state. Um, and so we've been trying to figure out where bats in Maine are hibernating. And one theory is that they're um, hibernating in talus caves instead of uh, like a typical solutional cave. And so a talus cave might be, so talus is just those big, big piles of tumbled down rocks. And if a bat could get far enough into one where the, the temperature wasn't going to change a lot during the winter. So the, um, what makes a really good hibernation site for a bat is that it has a very steady temperature uh, all winter. And so if, if bats can get far enough down into talus where the temperature isn't changing a lot, then they might be able to hibernate there. And so um, there's a grad student at UMO um, 
who's working with the state to try and identify some talus slopes that might serve as uh, alternative hibernacula for some of our bats here in Maine. And I think that that research should be coming out soon. I don't, I don't currently know the, the state of it, but uh, we we um, looked at some of the talus slopes um, here at Acadia. So this was uh, doing some winter work, um, looking looking for some of those talus slopes. Um, another project that the state is doing and that um, Acadia is also doing is um, we're all involved in this North American Bat Monitoring Program, which is a very cool program. It's a it's across North America. Um, and it's uh, to try and get a better idea of how all of our bat populations are, are doing in general. And so the way that it's set up is they, they took like a big grid and just laid it across the United States, well, actually North America. Um, and then there are um, priority grid cells within that um, that are chosen randomly and um, they have a, a set um, acoustic sampling protocol. So uh, the NABAT, the North American Bat Monitoring Program has been trying to get different agencies and organizations um, to go and do that protocol in, at those sampling sites and then upload the data to their website so they can um, just gather a huge amount of data and start to um, get a better sense of how our our bat populations are doing in general. And so I know the state is um, working to sample some of their priority grids. And uh, <laughs> at Acadia, our one priority grid falls um, on one of our out islands that we have a really hard time getting to. So we don't actually sample there, but um, we do run the, the same protocol um, on some of our other grids and, and submit the data. So we're, we're doing our best to uh, contribute to this effort, which is a, a pretty cool, pretty cool effort. Okay, so there's that idea of the, the whole, whole of North America looking at how bats are doing. We're trying to do sort of a similar thing, but just at Acadia National Park. Um, and so you can see this map is sort of similar to the one that I just showed in that there's a grid over MDI and um, there's some little red grid cells in there. And so what we've been working on is a long-term model modeling program um, for our bats so that we can learn more about how our bat populations are changing over time. Um, and so we've been, we also have a, a set protocol for acoustic sampling and we go out and um, put up our acoustic detectors um, on these randomly selected grids throughout the summer. And uh, we've only been doing this for <laughs> a few years, so we don't have any like exciting results yet, but over time, we're hoping that this will give us a better idea of how our bat populations are doing. And um, I should mention that we are collaborating with Eric Blomberg at University of Maine at Orno to help us out with this. Um, he is a statistician there and has helped us with a lot of the stats that uh, we wouldn't be able to do on our own. Um, we do a couple of other things with our acoustic detectors. As I mentioned, we submit data to the NABAT program. Um, we also use our acoustic detectors to do some compliance work, which just means that if the park uh, wants to say, um, redo the roof of a historic building, um, well, we can put out our acoustic detectors and say, mm, there's some bats in this area. Maybe we should be careful about redoing that roof because they might be using that roof um, as a day roost. And uh, then we can work um, with our maintenance team um, to 
maybe move that work either earlier in the spring or later into the fall. And so they're, they're not going to be doing it in the middle of the summer when the, the, um, when there might be um, new pups or pregnant females. Um, so if we can just sort of uh, do our best to, to protect our bats, um, give them the best chance that they can get. Um, this is one way that we've been doing that. Uh, so some of our mist netting work, uh, we have a really long history of, of mist netting at Acadia. Um, we've been trapping bats every summer. Well, uh, that's what I used to say. We, <laughs> we trapped bats every summer from 2008 through 2019, and then we could not trap them in 2020 uh, because there was a moratorium on bat trapping that the US Fish and Wildlife Service put out um, due to concerns that humans would spill SARS-CoV-2 back into bats. Um, so we've, we've put a little hold on our, our mist nutting work. Um, but we're hoping that they'll come out with some new guidelines and we'll be able to do that again this year. Um, so we're hopeful. But in the, in the past, um, we, I sort of talked about some of the things that, uh, that you can get from, from actually handling live animals. So you can get samples, you can take um, hair samples and tissue samples, you can swab. We, we, all of the bats that we catch, we swab with little, um, little Q-tips uh, and then we send that off um, to get tested to see if there's, um, uh, if the, the bats have white nose syndrome. Um, and then you can collect fecal samples and you can collect parasites and blood. Um, we mostly are collecting uh, the hair and swabs and the fecal samples and then also tissue, which we use for um, just as a, uh, a double check um, on our species ID. We send that off for genetic testing. So this is, I don't know, somebody, this might be my hand, taking a little hair sample, just to take a little clip with some little tiny scissors. All right, um, so I've mentioned roosts a couple of times. Um, having, being able to do radio telemetry with our bats, uh, we can see if different species use different roosts. Um, and actually we have, we've found some interesting results uh, that are not necessarily the same as the rest of the country. Um, so first we found that a lot of our bats use rock roosts, uh, which is not, not the case elsewhere. Um, there are some species that are known for using rock roosts, but we've found that really almost all of our species will use rock roosts. And I think that's just because we have a lot of rocks. Um, so in that, that picture with that rock roost, there's a crack in that rock and there was a bat wedged back in that crack. Um, they'll also use anthropogenic roosts, like a lot of our historic buildings. And then, of course, they use trees. So they'll just climb up under some bark. Um, and so uh, we've, yeah, we've learned a lot about um, which types of roosts different bats use um, through that radio telemetry. And then what we were working on in 2019, we really didn't get to continue in 2020, but hopefully we'll pick it up again soon, is if bats caught in different, on different parts of the island use different types of roosts. So we were looking at one species, we were looking at the eastern small-footed bat, um, and we were looking at two different valleys on the island. And what we were finding was that bats caught in one valley tended to go roost in uh, houses or anthropogenic roosts, but bats caught in sort of the next valley over tended to use rock roosts, which we thought was sort of interesting. And we were trying to look into that more. 
Um, and hopefully we'll get to pick that up again this year. Uh, well, we'll see. And that was all I had, but maybe people have questions, but um, I just quickly want to say thank you to the large number of organizations that have helped with that work um, at Acadia and, and the state, the National Park Service, obviously, and um, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and then College of the Atlantic, and uh, Scudic Institute. Actually, Scudic Institute employs some of us over the winter, um, which is great. We're very thankful for that. Um, University of Maine and Friends of Acadia, and then Biodiversity Research Institute um, has given us a lot of support over the years. Great, thank you so much, Morgan. Great. We have a long list of questions, so okay. whenever you're ready. <laughs> um, so I get, yeah, we'll just start with the first one, and that was from Denise, and she said that the bands that you put on the bats, they looked pretty large. Do they impede the bat at all? Um, so I was trying to figure out, uh, I want to stop. There we go. Um, no, so they're um, they're made out of they're they're made out of a very thin aluminum, um, so they weigh like almost nothing. And <clears throat> excuse me, it um, the way that they are pressed over that bone means that I don't know. It's kind of like wearing a bracelet. Um, yeah, we've we've recaptured lots of bats with bands, and they they're doing fine. So no, we don't think it impedes them at all. Great. And then it looked like um, Denise had a second question and she asked, actually, there's two questions about bat boxes. So what's your opinion of bat boxes? And then Denise was specifically looking for maybe information in the mid coast region to encourage bats to thrive. And then Sarah had a question about the best kind of bat boxes to get for roosting. Yep, people like to ask me about that one. Um, <laughs> so, and I never quite know how to answer this question. So if you don't have bats in your area, you're not necessarily going to encourage bats to come hang out by putting up a bat box. Um, however, if you have a barn that has a lot of bats and you would prefer the bats to be in a bat box instead of in your barn, then putting up a bat box can, can help and they probably would prefer it. Um, so yeah, anyway, if you are interested in getting a bat box, I would recommend looking at um, Bat Conservation International has a part of their website where they talk about different bat boxes and what is best for what parts of the country. And I know that for the Northeast, um, you want a fairly small bat box because we don't have um, the really big bat populations that maybe Texas has. Um, and then you want to paint it black because you want it to be as warm as possible. Um, that's like it really warm. Uh, that's that's why they often will go hang out in in a barn or something with you know you think of a barn with a sort of typical metal roof where it gets really warm, and they they like that. That's a good place for them to hang out and raise their pups. So yeah, smaller and painted black. And I can try and find the Bat Conservation International. Um, link to bat boxes, but not probably not the second. <laughs> um, great. The next question was, are there any citizen science opportunities within the project that you were talking about? Um, I'm trying to think if there are any that are currently happening. Um, the park isn't currently running any, uh, mostly be 
because of COVID. Um, I know that Eric at UMO has run some in the past, and I don't know what I don't know if the state is doing anything. Um, the there is a there's a company that makes these um, little tiny baby acoustic detectors that you plug into your phone, and they're maybe two hundred dollars, and then you can you can walk around in the evening, um, and if there's bats in the area, then you'll you'll see those sonograms show up on your phone, which is very cool and uh, a great citizen science opportunity right there. But there's not any that are currently running in the state that I know of. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, great. We, let's see, we have another question about bat boxes. I think that just came in. So maybe we'll answer that one before we move on to the other questions. So it says, should you put up several bat boxes or just one to attract bats if they're in the area? How many bats would roost in a single box? Um, I would just put up one. Um, I would just make sure to, to look up the specifications. They're supposed to be up fairly high and pointed south and painted black. Um, how many bats will roost in one bat box? Well, it depends on the size of the bat box. Um, down in Texas, uh, you can see these like bat condos that are just these enormous structures and I have no idea how many bats shove themselves up in there. I mean, I think I mean, thousands, um, hundreds of thousands, uh, but <laughs> certainly, we certainly don't see that in Maine. Um, the largest number of bats that I've ever seen roosting together in Maine, which was not even in a bat box, was like 11. <laughs> so. We just don't, we just don't have as many bats. I know that didn't really answer the question, but. I guess that's a great segue into our next question from uh, Lindsay of, is the bat population rebounding? Um, I used to see them a lot in Grand Lake Stream and now they're seeing them very rarely. Yeah, yeah. Um, A hard question to answer. Um, they what, So what we've seen in Acadia is that after White Nose hit, we saw uh, just a, a huge decline, um, but it didn't completely bottom out. We still have some bats. Um, none of them have gone to zero, like they haven't been locally extirpated. Um, so we hope that that means that they are starting to build up some sort of resistance or just the bats that have survived are just doing better with the fungus. Um, and so we're hoping that eventually we'll see those numbers start to come back up again. Excuse me, unfortunately, because bats only have one pup a year, it's going to take a very long time for populations to climb back up to where they were pre white nose. Um, pro like probably not within my lifetime. Um, but yeah, I think there is some hope that they're starting to come back up. And uh, I saw there's um, a question of have any populations um, showed any sort of resistance um, to the white nose syndrome? Um, let's see. So I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think back to some talks that I've seen recently. Um, 
So I know that they've been they've been doing some research um, in Pennsylvania and New York, uh, looking at the bats that have survived, like you know what's what's special about them, and it does look like the the sort of fatter bats do better. So bats that are going into hibernation with um, just a larger percentage of body fat. Um, I, yeah, I don't know about like specific immunological changes or functions that have been identified that have let some animals do better. I know there are, there are folks looking at that, uh, but I don't get to do a lot of lab work these days, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of them. That might lead into the, there was a question is, is there a cure for white nose syndrome? Um, no, not a, there's not like a nice silver bullet. Um, there's a group that's been uh, doing some interesting work uh, spraying the inside of caves with um, uh, polyethylene glycol, I think. Um, it's, it's really hard. You can't, cave environments are, um, really fragile because there's a lot like the ecosystem in there is very fragile and so you can't just wait until summer go in and like spray the whole place with bleach um because you'll you'll kill lots and lots of good things um along with the fungus and so um it's been it's been tricky um but there are definitely people working on that problem a lot of you are working on that problem there's a big grant that's out right now, um, specifically for um, trying different treatments for white nose, um, and then also looking at like different vaccines, which is pretty cool. I don't know how you, I don't know how you would vaccinate an entire bat population, but uh, somebody's looking at it, so that's cool. Looks like uh, we have another question of why is it critical to research bats? How do they benefit the ecosystem? Yeah, well, um, the uh, the economic answer to that question is that, um, and now I can't pull the number off the top of my head, but uh, bats eat a large number of insects and they save farmers some huge amount of money every year um, by eating eating pests that would otherwise be eating crops. Um, so that's the like human answer. <laughs> um, but uh, bats are, are, they're also just, they're critical to our ecosystem and um, you know, they, they eat insects and then they have predators that eat them, mostly sort of owls and, and hawks. Um, I don't know, they're, and they're cool. Um, there's another question, are we looking for any transmissible Missable diseases in the bats that are analyzed, like SARS. Oh, great question. Um, so, in general, in North America, no. <laughs> um, there have been like a, a few groups that have done a little bit looking at different um, viruses that that bats in North America might have. Um, but uh, no, that was not something that, that people were previously looking at really at all. Uh, but I suspect <laughs> um, there might be some more interest in that coming up. 
I've already heard about a couple of people saying, oh, yeah, we should really be like seeing what our our bats here in the US have. Um, so so hopefully we'll, that'll be some research that somebody will be doing and we can, you know, take some samples and send them off somewhere and learn more about what viruses our, our bats have, which would be really cool. Um, uh, I guess I should note that um, so um, bats in the United States have not so far not been shown to be susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, they can get coronaviruses. This is getting into virology that I, I, I don't like completely understand, but there's a couple of uh, like subgroups of coronaviruses and um, our bats in North America do, they, some of those subgroups have been found in bats in North America, but not, not the subgroup that is, that includes SARS and SARS-CoV-2 and MERS. Um, so, uh, for more detail, talk to a virologist. <laughs> awesome. Um, there are a couple questions about um, how pesticides and insecticides affect um, bats. Yeah, so that's not actually a topic I know a huge amount about. Um, I would imagine that like broad scale spraying of insecticides. I mean, if it's dropping the insect population, then it's probably reducing um, prey for bats, um, which would be bad. Um, I know there's some papers out there looking at um, like how different pesticides and insecticides affect the actual animals, but I, oh, it's just not my, it's just not my area. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so do you know how bats achieved the delayed implementation fertilization for their reproductive cycle? Um, I can never remember if it's, I think that it's, I think it's stored sperm. So I think that the animals mate and then the female stores the sperm sperm for the winter and then the sperm implants or the yeah in the spring but but I am not positive and would have to look it up. Fair enough and um, I guess our sort of uh, last question um, as we're running up against 530 um is are there any bat talks in the park that the public can come and see um and participate in oh i should have looked that up <laughs> um so i know in the past we've done we've had bat talks uh and different bat programming i don't know what um the interpretation and education program has planned for this year. Uh, I know that they, I know that last year everything was greatly reduced um, because of COVID-19. Uh, and I think this year they're starting to open some things up again. But in the list that I saw most recently, I didn't see anything about bats that they were doing in person. Um, but I'm sure the, the park website um, as they add programs back in, uh, they'll be on there. Yeah, well, I, I should, <laughs> I should have looked that up first. There's none, there's none that I'm involved in. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Morgan, for coming out and talking to us about bats and answering all of our questions. And thank you, Kathy, for, um, co-hosting this with us. It looks like we're, uh, just about at 5.30, um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out and participating. Thanks, Kendall. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We'll see you later. Bye.